Tonight on UK Undercover, inside Britain's most notorious hospital, Broadmoor. It's 20 miles south of Reading in Berkshire. Its inmates are some of the most difficult, disturbed and dangerous men and women in Britain. You talk to almost anybody in the health service or outside the health service and you say you worked in the special hospital and there's immediately half a dozen names that they reel off. You know, oh, did, you, did you meet Sutcliffe? Did you meet Cray? Public perception is that, that they are the most dangerous people in the country. Uh, many people believe that you should lock them up and throw away the key. 20 years ago, the producers of this film made a program which exposed scandals inside. After you've seen a patient kicked and punched unconscious, after you've seen a, seen a patient strangled with a wet towel, after you've seen a patient given electroconvulsive therapy without an anaesthetic, you get to a point where the odd punch um, you really wouldn't bat an eyelid at. After many critical reports, the government sent in new managers to reform the hospital. The reason I went into the hospital was that there had been a very damning report, public report, um, which made it clear, change it or close it. Exclusively on UK Undercover, the men and women who were sent in at that time tell us how many of their reforms have been sabotaged. 20 years on, we've returned to discover almost identical allegations of neglect and abuse. I was frightened. I tried, I just, just laid there and like, took it. He was bouncing up and down with his knee on my head. He had his knee on top of my head and he was jumping up and down with it. With it. He was a big bloke as well. And behind the high-tech fences, one extraordinary development. Shackling the mentally ill stopped in Britain in the 19th century. But in 2000, Broadmoor used arm and leg shackles as part of the treatment for a mentally retarded man. Patients' relatives are scared about the suicide rate, especially among the 60 women patients. Karen was one of two women who died in the first 10 days of January this year. She left this message on the wall of her room. Last month, the government announced a new mental health bill that will create more maximum security facilities like Broadmoor. The question isn't just, do they work? But what are they trying to do to patients? Cure them? or just lock them up. All societies struggle to cope with the small number of mentally ill people who are violent to others. Broadmoor has been part of Britain's less than perfect answer for 140 years. It's not a prison, but an NHS hospital. It costs 60 million pounds a year and has 1,200 staff. There's a lot of fear in the hospitals. They're, 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 they can be quite eerie places. But if the, the predominant notes are uh, we've got to keep this lot under control, we've got to keep them down, um, and we're very scared of what will happen if we don't keep them down, um, then you start stripping away the individuality and you start stripping away the opportunities for them to, to regrow. When Broadmoor opened in 1863, it was a progressive experiment. Since then, its history suggests something of a split personality, sometimes more of a prison, sometimes more of a hospital. Victorian doctors had no tranquilizers or antipsychotic drugs, but they believed fresh air, music, dancing and farm work would heal the patients. Many inmates suffered from schizophrenia, plagued by voices which told them what to do. The most remarkable was Richard Dad. As a teenager, he learned to paint at Cobham House. In his early 20s, he went sketching in the Middle East. But he became paranoid. A year later, back in England, his voices told him to kill his father. It would seem that he had a paranoid illness, probably a schizophrenic illness, which is almost indistinguishable from the sort of condition that many people suffer from today. Yet Broadmoor let Dad have a studio, and there he painted from memory. The grasses at the spot where he murdered his father appear in this great painting which hangs in the Tate Gallery today. In Dad's time, the walls around Broadmoor were only four feet high. By 1950, they were 12 feet high. The higher the wall, the higher our level of anxiety about the mentally ill. Few killers have provoked as much anxiety 
as John Straffan. He murdered two children in Somerset. In 1952, he escaped from Broadmoor. Army and police hunted him for 24 hours, but they were too late. He was found guilty of murdering another six-year-old girl. Straffan, demented child killer, fixed the image of Broadmoor in the public mind, an asylum for the bad and the berserk. When a patient escaped, the local schools were closed. In 1963, a hundred years after Broadmoor opened, two inmates climbed on the roof and got a huge audience. The beasts were wrecking the cage. But critics started asking why inmates were driven to such protests. Some inmates have always died inside, like gang boss Ronnie Cray, because they were too dangerous to ever let out. For psychiatrists, the crucial problem is knowing when someone is safe to release. One of their most tragic failures was Graham Young, who first went there in 1961 as a 14-year-old. The Graham Young story was a, a remarkable one. Uh, he was a very bright child. His father made the serious mistake, as it turned out, of giving him a chemistry set for his 11th birthday because he was very interested in science. What he was really interested in was poison. And he experimented with his family. He would put doses of strychnine in the Sunday joint to see what happened and keep a log. Uh, and then he would put a bigger dose of strychnine in the Sunday joint and he killed his stepmother. He permanently maimed the internal organs of his sister and his father and uh, eventually got caught um, and sent to Broadmoor for 10 years. There were incidents while he was inside Broadmoor. He uh, put Harpic in the tea urn that was wheeled around, and a lot of inmates or patients got uh, badly damaged internal organs. The Broadmoor Placement Service, which finds jobs for people leaving the prison, uh, sorry, the mental hospital, uh, he was then in his early 20s, managed to find him a job at a photographic laboratory in Hertfordshire which is the only industrial unit in the country that uses a rare metal poison called thallium, which Young was very interested in and was in charge of as a storekeeper when he arrived at this place. And he promptly managed to kill and injure several other people. He killed two workmates, poisoned several others with thallium, putting it in the tea again. Young's room was covered with pictures of Hitler and swastikas, but the doctors didn't heed the warning signs. Psychiatrists in charge of him actually wanted to think that they'd effected some miracle cure on this murderer that they'd been told uh, was uncurable. Um, and society paid the price for that. The Graham Young fiasco hurt the hospital, and some staff seemed to take it out on patients. By the end of the 1980s, Broadmoor was under attack. The hospital admitted some sex offenders were given drugs to chemically castrate them, and that electroshock therapy was used without proper precautions. Many patients claimed they were beaten in seclusion cells, as our investigation at the time discovered. I was a bit irritable when they said, oh, you haven't made your bed, and I just thought, oh, it doesn't matter, I got dressed and I went down. And I didn't mean in any way to be defiant or, or behave, it's just my nerves were so bad I sort of couldn't get it together, you know, and I couldn't even get it together to say to us, well, look, you know, I'm, I'm feeling very bad, you know, could I, could I leave you, could I come back and cut up later and, and make it, you know. One nurse followed me down, he grabbed me, he was behind me, grabbed me around the throat and started putting the pressure on. There was an automatic reaction, I mean, this wasn't the first time I'd had uh, someone, uh, a nurse, grab me around the throat. The automatic reaction, I swung around like that, and it was a gesture, and it tapped his chest, literally, quite honestly, no harder than that. A patient's seclusion in a side room and consequent beating usually followed some provocation from the patient. He'd usually attacked a member of staff, um, although that was not always the case. So I was stripped naked, and one of these nurses went, just like strapping his hands together, and I said, and they said, lock him in. They said, first of all, he said, like, just like this, the treatment. 
and three pairs of size 10 boots started to go into me. I wouldn't like to say how long they kept up. It's very difficult, I said, to judge time, but it might have been a minute or two. But just say, you know, a large area of my body was confused. I was not in fact black and blue, I was green and purple and all different colours, you know, uh, for days afterwards. The reason I went into the hospital was that there had been a very damning report, public report, um, which made it clear, change it or close it. The final stinging criticism came in the Hospital Advisory Services Report of 1988, which complained, Broadmoor is too custodial and time is running out for the hospital. The government's answer, new managers whose career had been spent running normal hospitals. They were looking to make the special hospitals part of the health service. Uh, they wanted to take the techniques that were being used generally, use them on the special hospitals, and change the atmosphere and I think the direction of the special hospitals um, to make them more therapeutic. In 1988, Franey took over an overcrowded hospital. Many patients lived in dormitories. People still had to slop out. The new boss set out to learn about his patch in a way few health managers do. I turn up at six o'clock in the morning and present myself on a ward and say, I'm here, I'm a nursing assistant, I'm here for the shift, um, so use me as you want. And in some wards did and some wards didn't. Um, you know, I, I would be serving breakfast in one ward um, or just observing in another. The reason I did that was because I wanted to see, first of all, what the patients did. Did they just sit around smoking or were they actually uh, engaged in purposeful activity, uh, either in the workshops or in education? Franey got money for new buildings. More patients were given individual bedrooms. Better workshops allowed patients to learn more skills. The plumbing was new, but the attitudes were still traditional. One difficulty was that Broadmoor's nurses have always belonged to the Prison Officers Association, the POA. It's a bit like the National Union of Mine Workers representing uh, teachers. You know, it just struck me as absurd. They're a very effective union, um, and they did a lot, and still do a lot for their members. But their approach was not in line with the um, style of management and the, the environment, the therapeutic environment, that I was wanting to push through. Franey and Kay had this footage shot. It's so bland, it's quite strange. No tension, no confrontation, nothing controversial. The new managers wanted to change Broadmoor's lurid image. They aimed to make it, and to make it look, ordinary. They weren't being cynical, but trying to make the hospital part of the NHS. Their efforts got recognition and even a royal endorsement. In November 1995, Princess Diana came to open the Richard Dad Center, which specialized in treating violent men. I was very keen to actually have a visit the hospital because it actually had quite an impact um, on the people she met. She met some of the most dangerous patients, uh, particularly female patients. She was able to talk with them, um, and they were quite open in the discussions that they had with her. She just had a natural ability, which I hadn't actually seen, and haven't to this day seen in, in anybody else. I know that the centre, with its academic unit and Phoenix therapy unit, will further enhance the work of the hospital. It therefore gives me great pleasure to formally open the Richard Dad Centre. May I now introduce <coughs> Professor Pamela Taylor. There was a lot more emphasis on providing specific treatments and appropriate treatments from across the whole range of therapeutic possibilities. Male and female patients were allowed to mix more as Franey tried to make life inside this abnormal environment as normal as possible. Good. Art 
therapy and even music hall were encouraged. And as this extraordinary footage of an extraordinary performance shows, an attempt was made to allow patients a degree of freedom and an opportunity to express themselves. Today, Broadmoor's theatre is no longer used. It's too much of a security risk. That's a symbol of yet another radical change. Most of Franey and Kay's reforms have been overturned in the name of security. But the patients still suffer from the same problems, mainly schizophrenia or psychopathy which is now usually called antisocial personality disorder. Both are standard conditions. But Broadmoor insists its patients have to be controlled to be treated because they can get so violent. In an environment like Broadmoor, where you've got some very disturbed people, um, there is always the potential for an incident of some kind. The attack took place in Broadmoor about three o'clock this afternoon after Sutcliffe was involved in an argument with another patient. It's not the first time Sutcliffe has been attacked. He's seen here attending a court hearing in 1983 after alleging he was slashed with a knife in Parkhurst prison. And in Broadmoor last February, a fellow patient tried to garrote him with a piece of flex. Sutcliffe was jailed for the murders of 13 women at the Old Bailey in 1981. Tonight, the mother of one of his victims said he was now suffering. There were incidents where patients attacked each other, um, where occasionally a patient would attack a member of staff, but that wasn't a regular occurrence. But not all the patients are violent. Broadmoor itself admits over 100 of its 400 patients don't need such high security. I know a man who's been in Broadmoor now for just over 20 years. He was originally sent to Broadmoor because he had thrown a stone through an employment office window. Um, he had paranoid schizophrenia, he still has paranoid schizophrenia, and he was too much for the local hospital to handle 20 years ago. And it seemed cruel to send him to prison because he was mentally ill, so he was sent to Broadmoor. After the allegations of the 1980s, the government set up the Mental Health Act Commission to protect patients' rights. It's never spoken about Broadmoor before. Steve Klein heads the team that inspects the hospital. The job of the Mental Health Act Commission is to review the care and treatment of detained patients. When you go into Broadmoor, the primary sense you get is of wasted lives. I don't think there's any argument that some people need to be detained in conditions of high security. But there are certain obligations in return for detaining people under very, very restrictive regimes. There isn't a reciprocal obligation. Firstly, to treat people for the mental disorder that's brought them in. Secondly, to treat them humanely. And thirdly, to keep to an absolute minimum the amount of time that people need to be in this very restrictive environment. We were told these safeguards had solved the hospital's old problems. Our research suggests otherwise. Wayne Drinkle has been in Broadmoor since 1999. He's never killed anyone. Wayne claims that on the admission ward, a nurse tried to get him to lose his temper, as he told his legal representative. He says that he kept his hands down by his side, uh, and that the member of staff punched him on the nose and then put him in locks onto the floor and claimed that he, Wayne, had made the first move. And we've run a complaint and it's still, it's still ongoing, so that I'm limited in exactly how much I can say about that. The allegation has been denied. We've talked to seven current and ex-patients all complain of neglect or abuse. Two agree to appear on camera. Billy threatened police with a replica gun after his sister's sudden death. At the Old Bailey, the judge wanted him to go to a medium secure hospital. On anger, I said, I'll kill you, but I didn't really mean it. I didn't mean it at all. 
And so what happened when you said you'd kill the judge? He said, I'm going to put you in Broadmoor. Tony was convicted of armed robbery and had suffered depression in prison before going to Broadmoor. There, he had to get used to its routines. Well, after a few occasions, I realised that, that after trying, you know, sleeping in and the common say one once the common wake you up and you still in bed come back again and if you and they drag the sheet off you at the mattress. They made sure you got out of bed. Pull the covers off, just drag you out of bed. I was on about two hundred milligrams every two weeks of clopixel and it used to leave me in such a state I couldn't I could barely open my eyes during the day never mind asking when they used to ask me to get up in the morning, I, I didn't feel like getting out of bed. It would used to knock me out for like six. Another method they use is that, you know, they said, right, um, we lock you in seclusion for the rest of the day. We lock your room, we lock you in the room, so you stay in seclusion for the rest of the day if you're five minutes late in getting up. The seclusion should be used really only as a last resort. There was a problem with seclusion. Um, many felt that it was inappropriately used uh, as a method of containing people um, and there were many critics of the seclusion, particularly the Mental Health Act Commission, were highly critical of the use of seclusion um, and we introduced a strong policy that meant that there had to be very sound reasons for a patient being secluded. But seclusion is still a problem, we discovered. In the past, seclusion cells were padded cells with only a mattress and a cardboard chamber pot. Today, there's a proper toilet and an intercom. Seclusion is supposed to be time out, a time to cool off for a patient in crisis, not a punishment. I was put in seclusion. I had to go out to some pedophile and the child's nurse said, don't have a go at him. I had to go at him. The child's nurse. Mm. Next minute, it was about ten prison staff on me, threw me in seclusion room. I was there for about two months, beaten up and injected, and then I was like out of it. I can't really remember much after that. I was frightened. I tried. I just just laid down and like took it. He was bouncing up and down with his knee on my head. He had his knee on top of my head and he was jumping up and down with it. With it. He was a big bloke as well. It was terrible. They took all my clothes off me and put me in this... You couldn't rip the suit or anything. I, I think it was in case you self-harmed or whatever, or try to hang yourself or whatever. They'd give me this little kind of, like, suit, put that on, and I was just left there, just left there, day on end. Just... just laid there on, my, on this, this, this bed in the middle of the floor. Nothing in my room, nothing. I was allowed about three cigarettes a day. It was worse when I got out of seclusion. I was thinking, my sister's dead, now I'm in Broadmoor. And at first, he would tell me I shouldn't be here. And I had a word with my psychiatrist. He'd said I should be here for about seven years. And it was about two days after that, I just broke down in tears. They put me back in seclusion for that. I was told once to, 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 um, to clean the toilet. And um, I was cleaning it for about two weeks. And one day I said, look, I'm not gonna, one weekend I said, I'm not going to do it today because it's a Sabbath. I'm not going to work on it. So I said, right, um, go back to the day room. So I went to the day room. And about what it must have been about 10, 15 minutes, I was called to the, to the office. And I was said, all right, you got in seclusion. So I said, well, um, you was asked to clean the place, and you, you refused. There's about eight of these people, <laughs> nurses around me, and you know you, you feel intimidated because they are around you, surrounded you, and you, know, you, you stand there and they say, well, take off your clothes, you're going in seclusion. So I was taking off my clothes, I was prodding the back, I pushed someone's hand away, I don't know who was prodding my back, and, I uh, little broke, was a jump on me. A cross was put in my mouth, and I was being kicked, punched, and put in seclusion. Um, about two hours later, um, the door opened, and there was about 
three or four staff standing outside the door and two or three buckets of cold ice cold water was thrown over me. This was middle of the winter. I've always thought that, that Tony was a very honest person um, and um, the sort of person who would be likely actually to get into trouble because he sticks up for himself. I've heard patients say that pressure has been put on parts of their body that are known to be injured. Um, a hand that's injured being bent back. I've heard patients say that their toe is um, bent back in a restraint in a, in a particularly sadistic way. Though it would not give us an interview, the hospital offered a statement saying that Broadmoor investigates all reported allegations of assault and all serious allegations will also involve the police. Staff will be disciplined if there is evidence of maltreatment. However, we never comment on individual patients or their cases. Well, the POA would defend um, members who'd really behaved in, in a, not just an unprofessional way, um, uh, but in a totally reprehensible way. Uh, so members who were clearly involved in um, maltreatment of patients, unprofessional practices and so on. Uh, the POA would defend them to the hilt. A patient would allege that he'd been struck or ill-treated in some way. And you'd look for other witnesses. Has anybody else seen there? Who else was on duty? And you get a sort of um, Sicilian omerta, you know, a vow of silence. We won't say anything. As security dominates the agenda, Broadmoor is using more and more techniques which belong more to prison than to hospital. I notice now in the new directions on security that uh, were brought out in 1999 for the hospitals, handcuffs are freely mentioned and reference is made to following prison guidance for use of handcuffs when patients uh, are in different situations. Handcuffs are no longer the last resort. In the 19th century, patient shackles were removed in asylums all over Britain, including Broadmoor. 99 years later, the hospital imported shackles from America to use on a violent, mentally retarded man. Though one drug calmed him, Doctors argued shackling was more humane than keeping him in seclusion for months. I would be very, very concerned if, if um, shackling of patients like you'd shackle terrorists um, was used in an NHS environment. Using shackles marked a change in the hospital's culture, and it was no accident it happened just as a government report demanded more security. The four-foot wall has now turned into Fortress Broadmoor. It boasts a second wall, more fences and razor wire, which is illegal in a hospital under European law. Internal security was also stepped up. The Department of Health issued a series of directions on security precautions inside the hospitals, uh, which give no leeway at all, or virtually no leeway at all, uh, to clinical teams in the way that they work. We felt distressed and disturbed that quite so much money has been spent on physical security when there was no evidence that the kind of increase in physical security that we've seen of extra walls and fences was actually necessary. Um, people were not escaping um, over the walls uh, and yet um, something of the order of 55 million pounds has been spent on new walls at each of the hospitals and extra internal um, security. Even sweets are a security risk, as one psychiatrist who advises the Home Office learned. They detected in my pocket this packet of mints, and they advised me that I couldn't bring the mints into the hospital. And when I asked why, they said, well, they may be laced with some illicit drugs, and you might give one of the mints to a patient. And I said, well, I have been coming here for 25 years. Um, I am here by invitation of one of your doctors. Now, that's clearly uh, taking security steps to dotty extremes. And what worries me about it is that it's unthinking. It's not selective. Security is a concept. 
uh, and it's a subtle concept, and it involves the anti intelligent anticipation of hazards and risks. And it means that you should know who you're dealing with. It means you should understand the individual patients and their characteristics and what hazards their potential for antisocial behaviour you know, may present. All of what goes on at Broadmoor should be focused on individual patient need. The bigger the organisation, the more complicated the rules, the more they have to apply to everybody. And that's where Broadmoor will end, always struggle. I think that the general emphasis on security and, and um, the resulting lack of staff time for other matters has, has seriously affected people's day-to-day -day quality of life. For a start, not enough money, say, for psychologists. It's absolutely routine for people to have to wait well over a year um, to be able to start working with a psychologist. Even being assessed for work with a psychologist takes months and months and months. And so you've got people who are being brought into hospital specifically for certain sorts of treatment, and then they have to sit there and wait for years before they can actually get that treatment. We can't deliver the therapies always precisely when we say we're going to deliver them because um, we don't have enough people to be able to do that. And I think some other parts of the hospital have it much worse than we do. The Mental Health Act Commission agrees. It told us... The patients have insufficient purposeful activity, inadequate investment in therapeutic resources. There are not enough psychologists, for example. Patients also have insufficient access to fresh air. We cannot get our fresh air and exercise, and really um, the staff cannot provide it. So. Who's going to provide us with fresh air exercise? We all want to know that because that's what we're entitled to. That is legal, that's a that's statutory um, thing. Sane staff, insane patients, but the new security rules can make both feel equally got at. It's always true that having some kind of common enemy is a good bonding experience. Um, um, but as I say, I think the much more healthy position in terms of staff-patient relationships is to be working together on pro-social attitudes. And there's almost a little bit of a feeling that, you know, we're, we're now in this as delinquents together because we're all perceived as delinquents. <laughs> Despite all the problems, there is good therapy in the hospital. And one patient who complains of being assaulted by a nurse is fair enough to acknowledge it. Wayne Drinkle asked to be sent to Broadmoor because he was frightened he would end up killing someone. He wrote to us praising his care team on the admissions ward. Without them... I would probably have cracked up and killed a few sex cases in Broadmoor. Being locked up here always reminds me of my past in care. He would be the first to pay credit to the nurses on that ward who had patients to know that he needed to work through this anger and come out the other side. And he will say that that was the, the best bit of treatment he had um, was when he was letting this anger out. And Broadmoor was good for him in that it provided for him a contained setting where he felt safe enough to let out all of this rage. After two years, Wayne went to Professor Taylor's unit. Forty patients are on that unit. They created this poster. First, they learn to control their anger. Then they're encouraged to express their feelings, often feelings about what other people have done to them. Understanding what they've done to other people is less easy. Victim empathy comes right at the end um, because that's the hardest of all. Um, for some people to get in touch with what they've actually done to the person that they attacked, or sometimes in the case of those who've killed someone, what they've done to the people, the relatives of that person, the people that they've left behind. Mistakes have happened and they can be tragic, as Wendy Robinson knows. Her daughter worked in an open clinic in Torquay. Georgina did not know that one of the patients there, Andrew Robinson, had murdered. In 1986, he was let out of Broadmoor, apparently safe. Georgie was about to go off duty, and I think she had a coat in her bag. She often used to do home visits to end her day. And the nurse had spoken to a young female patient, and the patient asked to see Georgie before she went. So Georgie put her bag and her coat in the little coat room and went round to see this female patient in her bedroom and sat on the edge of her bed to talk to her. And the nurse went downstairs and all the rest of the staff were downstairs. Robinson apparently had seen her go into this patient's bedroom and he must have gone back to his room and got the knife. 
and gone in and attacked her from behind. She was stabbed 14 times. It was very bad, actually, and it was all around her neck and shoulders, and he nearly sliced her finger off as she tried to defend herself. There was a lot of paralysis that she suffered, and one of them was the muscles that worked her lung on one side, so she couldn't function with one of her lungs. So her breathing was tremendous. She was very frightened. And um, it's very difficult for me to talk about it because that's the most harrowing period. Those five weeks, we stayed at the hospital the entire time and I was with her when she died. You just question everything. You just think, how could it possibly happen? And uh, if he can actually murder somebody, he's murdered my daughter, surely, and being in Broadmoor before, he must have been extremely dangerous. The new security directions make it even harder now to decide when a patient is safe to release. There's been a drastic cut in one sensible practice. The hospital used to allow 900 parole outings a year. Doctors could judge how well patients coped with the pressures of freedom. Those outings have now been cut to 90 a year. From a patient's perspective, it is an extremely difficult place to be. You don't know how long you're going to be there. You have a very restricted world, and you don't really know what you need to do to get it right in terms of convincing people that you're safe. From a staff perspective, it is a very difficult world because you're working with extremely ill people and you want to work in a way which is both therapeutic and safe for all. And those contradictions are very difficult to reconcile. Depression and despair weigh heavy inside the walls. Time doesn't pass, it crawls. At certain times, patients are specially vulnerable. Christmas time, I always feel uneasy there because it's, it's a time of particular bleakness when people are reminded of what they've lost, their freedom, their family. And it's, it's a time when you, we, you come back after the Christmas break hoping that you're not going to be getting some bad news on the answer machine. An expert on the stress inside is a woman patient we've been communicating with, Janet Cresswell. A funny, talented woman, she gives her address not as broad more, but as broad mess. I suppose you're aware that this place has well and truly gone back in time. With present restrictions, I'm not even allowed a typewriter, never mind a computer. We have a very severe paper allowance, like death row. Death row is only partly an exaggeration. Suicide is a particular issue on the women's wards, with five deaths in just two years, far more than the average rate in the prison system. Janet Cresswell woke up on the 1st of January 2002 to a major crisis on her ward. A trip to the loo shows the office is full of people, police. It sinks in that the incident is on this ward. I feel cold and I say so. I'd like to get dressed. I'm handed a seclusion blanket. Shortly after 10 a.m., the area manager comes in. He regretfully announces that the patient has died, cause unknown. 40, a non-smoker, lots of medication. The psychiatrist interviewed her yesterday. Monica Gordon died in seclusion where she should have been supervised. She'd managed to hide and then take between 30 and 60 antipsychotic pills. Another patient, Karen Kerwin, committed two armed robberies and was sent to Holloway. After getting depressed, she was moved to Broadmoor. I visited my daughter on Christmas Eve. I had brought her presents from the family and her sisters, brother and that. Karen was looking ever so well. I stayed for my two hourly visit and um, I kissed her goodbyes and she told me she would phone me. Yeah, I think Christmas Day, which she did. She was excited and happy because uh, she had become engaged to a young man. 
Over Christmas, she wrote to her sister saying she looked forward to going to the Ritz for a bash on New Year's Eve. I wish, she sighed. On January the 9th, 2002, at 10 p.m., nurses saw Karen listening to music and writing in her room. 20 minutes later, nurses started checking patients at the other end of the ward. Karen was found hanging by her shoelaces and there was a message on the wall. She wasn't depressed. She wasn't being treated for depression. She was happy and positive and warm. This, this was quite unexpected. The inquest came to an unusual decision. The jury did not accept Karen was suicidal and returned an open verdict. Broadmoor told us that any suicide or suicide attempt is a traumatic event for the families of those concerned. Patient suicide is a risk in any psychiatric environment and the hospital puts a huge amount of effort into managing that risk. Judged over the medium to long term, the hospital does not have a bad record. We've never heard another word. And as usual, I keep it all hush-hush, you know, whatever their findings were. But Karen is just another statistic to Broadmoor, really. Most people assume madness and violence are linked, but the truth is very different. Most crimes are committed by people without mental illness, by normal citizens uh, choosing to exercise their free choice in a violent, unattractive and antisocial way. So let's remember we're dealing with a very small minority of all violent crime, but an important small uh, section. But the new mental health bill now wants more of us behind bars. The government is planning six mini Broadmoors to take 2,400 people with antisocial personality disorder. Not just killers or rapists, but anyone psychiatrists fear may become dangerous. Our current estimate is that the small cohort of patients, or potential patients that we're talking about, people that we're talking about, runs to between 2,100 and 2,400 people mainly in contact with the criminal justice system, overwhelmingly already actually in prison, but not exclusively so. Now, we are revising that estimate, and I have to say to, to the House that it is liable that that estimate will be revised upwards rather than downwards. If you ask me about the um, uh, new proposals um, that the government is considering about personality disorder and the provisions that might allow someone to be detained in hospital for treatment indefinitely uh, against their will on the basis that they might commit a serious offence, I must tell you I'm very troubled about um, that proposal. It is reminiscent of some uh, regimes which we wouldn't wish to imitate, like the overcautious regime in, in the Soviet Union. During the Cold War, the West complained of the abuse of psychiatry in the Soviet Union. Political dissidents were locked up in hospital. Their only crime was to be off the communist message. Soviet doctors even invented a new illness. The dissidents were said to suffer from slow-burning schizophrenia. Slow-burning because they didn't show any symptoms yet. Whitehall isn't targeting dissidents, but like Moscow, it's invented a new illness. Dangerous people with severe personality disorder. Parliament has not yet changed the law, but UK Undercover has evidence that it is already happening stealthily. I have a number of clients. They've done their time in prison. They've done a full prison sentence. They've come to the very end of their stay in the prison system, having been judged all the way through as sane, as not mentally disordered in any way. And right at the end of their sentence, the story changes. Suddenly, a doctor, out of the blue, diagnoses them as being mentally disordered. Oh, we should have treated this man years ago. Instead of being in prison, he should have been in a hospital. Oh, and he's still dangerous. So we'll cart him off to Broadmoor the day before he's released, and we'll keep him there indefinitely. The most shocking fact is that even before the new mental health law is passed, last year, 271 prisoners were transferred to Broadmoor and other high-security hospitals at the end of their sentences. And there's something 
very wrong about that. And it's sometimes there's just no shame in it. It's the day, it could be even the day before the guy is due to be released that he's transferred to Broadmoor. I committed a most serious crime uh, against my, my first and only girlfriend in life so far. I wanted to let go, I wanted to marry her. And I still remember it vividly and I was fretty. William Collins was sentenced to four years in 1962 for attacking his girlfriend. He broke down in prison and went to Broadmoor where he stayed for 36 years. Under the new law, hundreds of prisoners are likely to face a similar fate. All the fighting, arguing, trying to fight my way out of Broadmoor and fighting my way out to this girl who is now nearly a 58-year-old woman. I'm 60 in January. All that, um, um, uh, I just reacted like that and uh, it, it, it wasted a lot of my life uh, uh, and all the uh, attacks and things I did on people, hitting people with things and throwing things and, uh, and all that. Uh, I down those first 30 years in Broadmoor on staff and patients. Uh, I, I, I did regret, but it, it was a sort of byproduct of, of what I'd fallen into. Of what you'd fallen into? Yeah, and I, 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 I wasn't effectively helped out of my trouble. Maybe I couldn't be, maybe I was just destined to spend a long time sorting myself out, and thank God I haven't killed anybody in the process. Most people know somebody, don't they, in their lives that has suffered some sort of mental illness. And I think there should be more sympathy, more understanding for those that do suffer from mental illness, and they should get the best care that's available. But there is this small percentage, this small percentage of very, very seriously, dangerously ill patients. They have a dangerous illness that can cause the death of other people. These people need very specialist care and they need high security. And I do not think that the general public should be exposed to these people. I'm sorry, but there has to be some, at the moment there is not in place the correct treatment, care, therapy for those type of patients. I just don't think it exists in this country at the moment. Thank you.